Fort Myers, where Pastor Mike was doing some family this morning, which is awesome. And you're here with me. So I'll pray for me and you pray for you. We're going to have a good time this morning. We're continuing our Foundations message series this morning about foundational things we as believers need to know and that we need to stand on. And I would say, really, if, if there is a, a need of the hour for the Church of Jesus Christ today, our need is to be people of hope. We desperately need hope right now. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, like, not like you're getting a root canal. Like, we need hope. Amen? amen? Hope that comes out of peace and joy and love and power because there's something that, that tends to go on within the church of what I would call an Eeyore spirit. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen Winnie the Pooh, the cartoon, but in Winnie the Pooh, there were two characters around Winnie the Pooh, two of his friends, and one was named Tigger, and one was named Eeyore. And when Tigger came around, Tigger just jumped up and down and was excited about everything and always saw the bright thing and everything and always wanted to go have an adventure, right? So when Tigger came around, the energy picked up. It was awesome. It was great. And then came Eeyore. Eeyore walked in behind Tigger, and if Tigger saw everything that was right, Eeyore saw everything that was broken. And when Eeyore walked, it was always down like this. He's always losing his tail everywhere he goes. And when somebody gives Eeyore a compliment and says, Eeyore, you look nice today, it's dance for no <laughs> And what I've seen happen in the church of 2017 is too much of an Eeyore spirit when we've been called to be Tiggers. We've been called to, to be and to possess hope. But I find too many believers who really love God walking around saying, Okay, it's another day. Gotta go to work. It's church this morning. Thanks for noticing. And we desperately need hope. We need to receive hope, and we need to be hope. And so right from the start this morning, and I will get into what I'm talking about in a minute, I promise. This is set the stage for it. There's a prayer that I want to give us this morning. It comes from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. And this is what the Apostle Paul said for us. He said, now, may the God of all hope. Okay? So who is God? He's the God of all hope. That's who he is. And it says, may he fill you with joy and with peace as you trust in him so that you would overflow in hope. Now, I like those words, because he says that God himself is the God of all hope. So that means no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what your circumstance, no matter what your bank account says, no matter how your car's acting, no matter how your marriage is going, he's the God of all hope, all circumstances, all people, all the time. That's who he is. It all resides in him. It doesn't have to come and originate from you. You need to receive it, not acquire it. You get the difference? It's not you earning it. It's you receiving what the God of all hope wants to give you. And then it says what he wants to do is he wants to fill you. And I love this because in Greek, the word is pleruo. So look at your neighbor and say, pleruo. Look, you just spoke in a different language this morning. That's awesome. <laughs> pleruo means for a cup to be filled to the absolute brim with no more room for anything else. If it gets another drop, it's going to spill everywhere. Now listen, I've got five-year-old twins. I know pleruo really well. I know what it looks like. For cups, and I don't know if you get this parent, but I've had times where my twins go to the refrigerator and the water dispenser, and I don't know how they do it, but they find a way to get it where not another drop could possibly fit in this cup, right? They go and they hold it, and then I rush over, wait, right? Nothing's spilled yet. And I say, that's too much. And when I go to take it from their hands, what happens? It spills everywhere. Who spilled it? So who has to clean it up? Yeah. So I understand play rule. Play rule means... Something is so full that the very next thing you should expect to happen is for it to pour out everywhere. Now listen, this is what God says. That joy, and peace, and hope, and power is supposed to play rupo in you so that it pours out. He wants to fill you with so much of it that it pours out and that you overflow, you bubble over in hope everywhere. I mean, that's good, right? But we can't walk around as, as Eeyores. And so we go a little bit further and say, what's God's plan for us? It's hope, right? And it goes even bigger than that. It's hope that's expressed in these beautiful ways. Galatians 5.22 says this. It says, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Now he said, that's the fruit of belonging to the Holy Spirit. Now, we know a lot about fruit in Florida, don't we? Okay? Orange trees everywhere. What comes out of orange trees? Oranges. <laughs> olives? Is that olives? Olives. Oh, yes, palm and dust. He said olives. Oranges come out of orange trees. 
trees. And so you can imagine if somebody's working in an orange grove, what they expect to see from a healthy orange tree is an orange. If chicken wings started coming out of orange trees, they would say, that's weird, right? Because chicken wings don't come out of orange trees, oranges come out of orange trees. Some of you would be a lot more excited, You're like, I eat fruit now. Chicken wings come out of orange trees. It's awesome. What's your favorite fruit? Some chicken wings? So listen, just like it's strange for a chicken wing to come out of an orange tree, he says this, you belong to the Holy Spirit. So the fruit that is supposed to naturally come out of you looks like this. It's love, and it's joy, and it's peace, and it's patience, and it's kindness, and it's goodness, and it's faithfulness, and it's gentleness, and it's self-control. What does that mean? It means when you get squeezed in life, that stuff's supposed to come out. And if anything else comes out, it's weird. You get it? Now that's convicting, isn't it? It doesn't seem like a way to start with hope, except... Can you produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control on your own? Anybody here know how to produce that? No. We don't. It doesn't come from within. We receive it from him. And he's the one who gives it, and he says that he wants to pour it out into us, which means this. If you are a Christian, I don't care your background, I don't care your bank account, I don't care your past. You are supposed to be deliriously happy, and it's supposed to be pouring out everywhere you go. There's no room for Eeyores. In the kingdom of God, you're not going to find people in heaven going, how's your day today? It's okay, I guess. <laughs> no, Jesus is risen. He's Lord. It's amazing. Hope is alive, and his name is Jesus. That's a reason to be excited. But I find for most believers that when we're squeezed, we're not seeing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all that stuff. We're seeing anxiety and stress and worry and fear. And so I started asking some questions to the Lord for my own life and for your life. And I asked him these things. I said, why do we overwork ourselves? Are we trying to make up for something we feel we still lack? Are we trying to become something we don't think we are yet? Why do we walk around with guilt? Why the restlessness? Why the discontent? Why is there the aching presence in most that is chasing some next achievement, next breakthrough, or next status instead of just being thrilled today? And why are we so inundated with entertainment? Do we wrap ourselves in everyone else's adventure to somehow dull the pain of feeling like our own adventure is going unlived and we don't have a clue what to do about it? Where is our home? And when I look at that question, if what we need what the church needs it to be seen as in our culture is hope. And I believe it. Listen, when we're overflowing with hope, there can't be an empty chair in the church. Hope is the need of the hour. It's got to be in us so that it overflows out of us. And it's not up to us to acquire it. It's up to us to understand something that happened a long time ago. And what I would find is this. For the foundation, what's the core of getting hope? I believe it's the reality of heaven. I believe we need to know the reality of heaven of heaven. And now I want to tell you something. If I was sitting where you were, hearing today's message, how I get hope is that heaven is real? Really? Yeah, it's nice, but it doesn't seem very useful right now. Right? Yeah. It's how we tend to think. But we've got to understand the reality of heaven because this is what I believe is going on. We don't really know where we're headed. And we don't really understand what's within us or what happened before us, so we don't have much to make sense of what to do today. We don't know what's ahead. We don't really know what happens behind us. And we're in the middle of a moment where we know our lives are supposed to count for something, and we feel we're failing. So we stress ourselves out. And in it, I want to tell you, if we can get the reality of heaven, since we get it. Now, here's the problem, though. When we come to that, most of us think of heaven like a future residence we get to one day once our work is done, right? Heaven's kind of like a retirement home. That's how most Christians think of heaven. You work hard here, you put in your time here, and then you get rewarded with heaven. Now, it doesn't just stop there, though. Heaven's kind of like a retirement home we don't like to think about and we're not sure we want to go to, if we're being honest. Look at how we cling to this life. Look at how we do death. Look at how we keep ourselves up way too many hours trying to squeeze every possible, every possible thing out of the here and now. Why? Because we're afraid of what's actually on the other side. You following? If we get to the place that we think of heaven, heaven's outside of our control, beyond our comprehension, and other than Jesus saying, it's great, we're a little uncertain about it, and it certainly doesn't fuel us with hope. Think about the way heaven is 
portrayed in most media. Yeah. Right? Here's the way it has been portrayed. First of all, it's always in the clouds, right? And why in the world is there so much fog in heaven? Like everywhere, seriously, you look around, every scene of heaven is like fog everywhere. People trying to clear it out of the way, right? Everybody gets the same standard white dress when they get to heaven. You have a halo and a heart. Okay. Do you understand why some people don't want to go? I mean, can you, can you imagine Bill, our guitar player? <laughs> that would be pretty awesome. <laughs> I would enjoy that. <laughs> Most people look at heaven and they think about heaven being this eternal dreamlike state. You're not really asleep. You're not really awake. You're just kind of floating around. And then there are angels. You say, well, what do angels look like? And in our culture, we say they look like pudgy little precious moments babies. Right? Yep. Listen, all of that sounds more like hell, not heaven. No wonder we're not sure we want to go there. But this is what we need to understand. The God who built this world built that world. He built this world in six days, and then he rested. 2,000 years ago, Jesus showed up and said, Hey, I'm putting the finishing touches on a home I have for you called eternity, called heaven. I'll come back when it's done. For the last 2,000 years, he's just been doing finishing touches and staging the area. Six days to build this whole one. From eternity past till now, building the future home for us. And he said that that's the place, this is broken, but that's the place where he's going to wipe away every tear from our eye, where every wrong will be made right, where we see Jesus face to face. Man, that's awesome. He said, if you really want to look at it, if life is like a house, this is the foyer, heaven's the mansion. If life is like going to the movie theater, this is like waiting in line at the concession stand. That's the main attraction. There are things broken here, and I want you to understand that, that if we don't really understand where we are right now, we're going to miss it. And here's the biggest thing. Yes, there's a future part about heaven, but there's something broken in our thinking, and it's this. You ready? you got to get this. It's the core thought of everything I'm going to talk about today. Heaven is not a future destination where you are a resident. Heaven is a present kingdom where you're called to reign. Amen. I'm going to say it again. You need to get it. Listen, I went through Bible college and through seminary and completely missed this. Heaven is not a future destination where you get to be a resident if you work hard enough. It is a present kingdom today that you are called to reign in. And if you miss it, you're going to go through this life restless because you know that you're called to some purpose, but you can't find where to press it. And so when you look at the story, let's go all the way back to the beginning here. There's this phrase within the Bible, the kingdom of heaven. It shows up 34 times in the New Testament. Why? Because heaven's a kingdom. It's not a destination. It's a kingdom. And I'll explain why that's important in a minute. 75 times, there's a synonym for the kingdom of heaven. It's called the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven in the New Testament are referring to the same thing. It is the kingdom where God reigns, undisputed. Follow? So we have kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. The Bible refers to another kingdom, though. It refers to the kingdom of this earth or the kingdom of the air. And in that kingdom, something very, very different is going on. And so I want to explain it like this. If you go to the beginning of the story, what you find out in the beginning of the book of Genesis is that God is king, undisputed. There's one kingdom. It's called the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. Everybody still following? Yes. Okay? So God's king, one huge kingdom, heavens and earth. And in this kingdom, we are called to be his sons and his daughters, and there's nothing like us in all of creation. And it says that the purpose of our life is found in us being with him. Which, by the way, every time you watch those YouTube videos that show a dad making a sacrifice for their kid, like, I don't know if you've seen the one, I think it's an ad from China or somewhere, and it's about the dad who gets up every day and goes and, and works, and he's stressed out, and he never gets to rest, and, and like you're watching him make all these sacrifices, and all these people chew him out, and at the end of it, he just runs, and his little daughter comes and hugs him, and like, you can't help but cry. Every time you've seen one of those ads, it's about a daddy and a daughter, or a daddy and a son. Something is screaming within you. The reason it's so touching is that's the relationship you were supposed to have with your God. Amen. That's what it's supposed to look like. You were made to be with him as a child. Right. But it's more than that because you're a son or a daughter of the king of kings. So when he had this huge kingdom, heaven and earth, he's the undisputed king. He called you and I to be kings and queens with him. And that's what you see we did in Genesis. We ruled over everything God had made, but there was a problem. In heaven, there were these group of people called the angels. 
By the way, what the angels are called to do, according to the book of Hebrews, is to serve those who inherit salvation. You. To serve kings and queens. To do what? To rule. Angels are called to serve us so that we can rule. But it says that within heaven, the most beautiful angel, the worship leader of heaven, suddenly became jealous. The Bible simply says evil was found in him. And he turned into a tyrant king. He said, I'm going to overthrow the kingdom of heaven and earth. He tried to stage a revolt. It was pretty effective. He took a third of the army with him. But ultimately, he lost his place in heaven, and he was cast down to earth. And there was a split. Now suddenly, there is a tyrant king who's trying to mess with the big kingdom. Everybody following? The treachery, he shows up. If angels are sent to serve us, the opposite is disservice. What did demons come to do? Disservice. You know what disservice is? Go to Waffle House. No, no, no. no. Why is the W always burned out on the Waffle House sign? Just wondering. All right. Sorry. So the enemy came with one purpose. The enemy's one purpose, listen. Kingdom of heaven and earth, you've been called to reign within that kingdom undisputed. You are more powerful than he is. He shows up and says, I'm going to mess up everything they're doing. I want to mess with their destiny. And he comes and he points out this one tree in the middle of the garden. He says, if you eat of this tree, you get a special knowledge. It's the knowledge of good and evil. And then he says this. He says, listen, you could be a king just like your king. You don't need his kingdom or his rules anymore. Let's build another kingdom where you rule. Everybody follow him? That's Genesis chapter 3. We ate of the fruit. This is what we didn't know. We were made for intimacy. We chose autonomy. And what we didn't understand is what we got was slavery. That's right. Can you say that again? Okay? We were made for intimacy with God. We chose autonomy. I'm going to be my own God. What we got was slavery. Why? Amen. Amen. Because the enemy was already a tyrant. <laughs> so at this moment, within heaven, the kingdom of heaven and earth split into two. They became two separate kingdoms. Kingdom of heaven kingdom of earth. That's why you see the phrases everywhere. In the kingdom of heaven, God reigns undisputed all the time for all of eternity. It's the true kingdom. It's the much more powerful kingdom. However, the most powerful dictator in the world can do anything except force you to love them. That's why God gave us a choice in the kingdom of earth. And we chose against him. And we fell into slavery. And so kingdom of heaven, kingdom of earth, kingdom of earth is now ruled by our enemy. And we are slaves to him. But in Genesis chapter 3, God makes a promise. He says, one day... Someone is going to come who is the seed of the man. Now, you need to get this. Why was Jesus going to come as a man? Because we've been called to reign. Jesus wasn't coming with an intervention. He was coming with an invitation for us to reign again. Amen. Okay? You've got to get it. He said one day he's going to come, and, and kingdoms are going to clash. And when they clash, the kingdom of heaven is going to completely crush you. By the way, 1 John 3, 8 says this. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the enterprise, the kingdom of the devil. You getting it? Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of earth. We were under slavery to this. He said, one day you won't have to be under slavery to this kingdom anymore. The kingdom of heaven is going to come. And when the kingdom of heaven comes, it changes everything in the here and now. Amen. Fast forward. A guy out in the desert wearing a hair coat and eating bugs named John the Baptist shows up. And he has one message. Repent! Turn around! Listen up! Pay attention! Why? Because the kingdom is near. He's saying the king is coming to bring his kingdom. And as soon as he sees Jesus, you remember what he says? Look, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not the kingdom is near, but the king is here. And then it says that Jesus starts going with the disciples, and they went everywhere doing three things. They preached what? The kingdom. Are you getting it? You see, we hear those words, and because we don't know what it is to live in a kingdom, we just go, oh, preach the kingdom means share your faith. No, preach the kingdom means there are two kingdoms. There's one kingdom of slavery. There's one kingdom of freedom. This kingdom is already alive and active. It's the superior kingdom. Preach to people to get out of this kingdom and to get into this kingdom. And Jesus went everywhere and did it. He did it with the twelve. He did it with 72 unnamed people. Then when he rose from the dead, he said that it was good that he was going away and sending the Holy Spirit into us because we were to be people who were going to enforce and move forward the kingdom of heaven so that the kingdom of hell would have to melt in its presence. That's awesome. Amen. And God says that we now reside in the kingdom of heaven. So I want you to get this. When you think of heaven, I want to move away from future destination. Because if you do that, all you're going to do is try to bide your time here and, and be a better person and incrementally try to cuss less and let more old ladies across the street and be nicer. And that's not what you were made for. You were made to reign. And until you reign, you will be restless. 
When God talks about the kingdom, this is how he says it. It's Matthew chapter 13. He says this. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in all of his joy, he went and sold all he had, and he bought that field. Now, I want to unpack this real quick as you look at this. First of all, it says the kingdom of heaven. Why? Heaven's a kingdom. It's not just some future retirement home. It's a kingdom, and it's present. It says the kingdom of heaven costs you everything. Look at it. It says the man went and sold everything he had. Why? Now, listen. To the rest of the world, this looked like a barren field. So the guy was somebody of prestige, somebody of influence, and he went and bought what looked like a crazy investment. He said, I'm trading everything for that barren field. Why? Because he knew there was a treasure in it beyond his wildest imagination. He knew it was billions times more than anything he could ever earn. And he didn't care that people looked at him crazy for it. By the way, when you understand the treasure of the kingdom of heaven, it won't really matter as much that people think you're crazy for being a Christian. It says that he was filled with joy. And that he went, and I want you to notice the verbs, they're not future tense. It's what you would expect talking about heaven, right? Everything we think about with heaven is future tense. The kingdom of heaven is going to be like a guy who one day is going to find a field, and when he does, after riding out the storm here and being the best he can because this world is broken and it kind of stinks, when he gets to the end of that, then one day he'll buy the field. Isn't that the way we talk about heaven? Hello, is this thing on? Isn't that the way we talk about heaven? But look at what he says. He says, no, the kingdom of heaven is already present. It said that a man, past tense, found it. And when he found it, he sold everything. And the minute he sold everything, he bought the field, which means what? He owns it. He's in it. The minute you come to Jesus Christ, you have switched kingdoms. You're no longer a resident of the kingdom of earth. You belong to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And listen, if you miss that, you're not going to understand what's happening in the kingdom of earth. Is it broken here yes. on earth? Yes. Are things messed up and dysfunctional? Yes. Are people mean? Yes. Yeah, go on social media, right? Yes, it's broken here. And what happens is if you miss what you've been called for, every point you come to something that's broken, you're going to shake your fist and you're going to blame God. And you're going to ask this question. Why didn't you just take me out of here? If you're so good, why didn't you just save me and beam me to heaven? Anybody ever ask that? You know what? You want to know why he doesn't beam you to heaven? It's for you. Because you've been called to have this laden purpose with God to be a general in his army, and generals have to fight battles. See, God doesn't want to come and say, hey, you're laden with purpose. You've been made to reign with me, and you're going to reign forever in a place where nothing's broken. No, that's not reigning. Think about it. It's not reigning. You walk into a place and say, I'm going to reign. I'm going to walk in authority. Well, everything's a well-oiled machine. Then you're just being. He said, no, you've been called to reign. You've been called to bring people from darkness into light. And here's where, here's where we've kind of gotten messed up, guys. And, and I don't mean this critically, but as, as the modern church, we've messed up the gospel. Anybody know what the word gospel means? Good news. Now, I want you to think about our modern gospel and how we're told to share it. We're told that it must start with sin, that you're a sinner, that there's a place called hell, and unless you turn around, you're going to burn. Yay, good news. <laughs> Does that feel like good news? No, and in fact, here's the deal. When we hear that we're supposed to go preach the kingdom like Jesus, what we've equated that to is you're supposed to share your faith. What we've equated sharing your faith to is telling people that they're sinners. Often people we don't even know to walk up to them and, hey, did you know you're a sinner? You're going to buy that shirt or that shirt. You're a sinner. You're going to go to hell if you don't turn around. Like, and then you wonder why you don't want to do that. You know what? I don't want to do that. I don't want to walk around and do that. It's not good news because I'd say this. Listen, if you start with sin as the starting point of the gospel, you've started in the wrong place. Amen. Sin's not the starting point. You know why? There was something that came before sin that's far more glorious. There was the God who is king, and he just yes. so happens to adore you. Yes. Before sin, there was the kingdom of heaven and earth, the place you were called to reside, the only place you're ever going to find peace and hope and life and adventure so that you don't have to sit in front of a TV screen and live out everybody else's. <clears throat> he said there's hope where do we start with the gospel if you want to tell people good news it's this guess what I know this place is broken but all this majesty that you see yeah. all this majesty that's incredible you know why because there's a God that is breathtaking he's alive yeah. he's amazing there's hope there's purpose there's morality there's joy and he adores you Amen. Amen. if the gospel doesn't start there it's not the gospel do we have to deal with sin? Of course we have to deal with sin. 
There's a reason Jesus had to come and save us, right? But we started in the wrong place. Can I even say that we end in the wrong place? Think about the way we tell people to share the gospel. A, B, C. Admit you're a sinner. Let's start in the wrong place. Believe in Jesus and call out to him to save you from your sins. You know what our ending point for the gospel is? To get you to pray a prayer so that one day you can get to the retirement home called heaven. So listen, I want you to get this. Why do most Christians walk around feeling like they're sinners and not saints? Because we started and told them that's who they are. That's, right. that's broken. Why do most Christians not feel like they're adored by God? Because we never told them they are. In fact, we tend to think, you used to not be adored by God. He hates you. He detests you. You come into the kingdom. He's like, yay, I love you. No wonder people don't trust God. God seems like a schizophrenic. But he says, no, I've always adored you. There's a tyrant king that came, and I promised you a long time ago, I promised you, I'd come and make it right, and I've done everything. I made all things new just time. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the gospel. Amen. But we've ended in the wrong place because we said, hey, here it is. You ready? There's great news. Here it is. Pray this prayer. Take this card. One day you'll get to heaven. For now, just ride out the storm and get as comfy as you can and be as nice as you can, people. That's not good news. You want to know often they talk about the younger generation leaving the church? You want to know why? Because we're not calling them to anything worth giving their lives for. Mm. We've been called to live in an adventure, and here it is. You ready? You want the gospel? Here's the gospel. God adores you. He thinks you're incredible. He made you exactly the way he wanted to make you, on purpose and in love, and he did everything. The way you think, he made it. Your sense of humor, he made it. Those little, those little nervous tics, spouses, think about your spouse, the things they do, the little, the little quirks, the little tics that they find annoying but you find adorable. God made it. He chose it. He thinks it's awesome. And it's not just that he made you with purpose. What's the purpose? That two kingdoms would clash, that you would trade kingdoms, and then you would come in this kingdom as co-ops, okay? <laughs> to take people from a kingdom of darkness to a kingdom of light, and then you would find all of his power, all of his grace, all of his strength. We've called people to So let's correct that. I've got a little bit more I'm going to share after this. But I'm going to ask a bold question right now. If you're here, and you've been hearing what I've been sharing, and it, whether you were five years old and you said, I prayed a prayer, but yeah, I'm kind of bored to tears with the Christianity thing, and I don't feel called to anything. I'm just riding up a storm like those people. <coughs> or maybe you're here going, you know what? I've been showing up at church, but I've never really known what to do with God because I don't get it. But right now you're hearing the fact that God loves you, he adores you, he wants to call you to purpose, he wants to call you to something that's going to ignite you. He calls you to adventure, and you say, you know what, I want to know who I am like that. Yes, amen. I want to know that. I want to walk in that. I don't get it right now. I'm not even sure I'm his. Maybe you're at the place that I don't know that I'm his. But man, I want to get it like that. I want to cross the line like that. I want that hope and that joy and that peace and that purpose, and I want my life to count for something today. I want it to make sense. I don't want to live under this junk anymore. See, that's the gospel. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to do something bold right now. I'm going to ask you to stand up. <coughs> if that's you, I'm going to ask you to stand up. Because we're going to do something. Like, Praise God. Yes. Anybody else? I didn't call you out to embarrass you. I called you out to be liberated. Yes. I want you to extend your hands. Yes. Holy Spirit, you say that when we come in with a childlike faith, that you meet us there. Thank you for these bold sons and daughters of God. Yes. yes. And right now, just from where you're standing, or even if you were sitting, listen, if your heart's beating in your chest and you're going, I just don't, uh, people are thinking this of me, listen, you pray just the same. Would you just say this, hey God, show me who I am. Show me that you adore me. For too long I've seen you as a rule maker waiting to get me. I need to know that you're a God waiting to love me. Show me that you adore me. I come bringing all my burdens, all my sins, all my problems. I can't solve them, otherwise they'd already be solved. I can't fix them. But I believe you came for me. Because you adore me and because you call me into adventure, 
I believe I'm called to be a king, a queen. Holy Spirit, come and fill me. Jesus, fully save me and show me who I am. And Holy Spirit, right in that place, I just pray right now that the fullness of your spirit will fall. That your grace, your peace, your mercy, new anointings. New anointings, God. I pray that every burden that you were never meant to carry would lift. Adoration for that. Pray the peace of the Lord. church talking about what's not yet. Amen. And not nearly enough time talking about what's already. Amen. Listen, already he called you from darkness to light. Already he's given you a new heart and a new spirit to follow him. Already he says that that thing called the sin nature is actually a coat that doesn't belong to you anymore. It needs to be thrown down and discarded on the ground because it has no more power in your life. Already. Already, already he says he's given you all you need for life and godliness. And by the way, in everything you're trying to get to in the not yet, you've been called to reign in the already. You've got to reign now. When we get to heaven, everybody who's there is redeemed. We're in a moment right now of the clashing of kingdoms, and we've been called to manifest him. Amen. I want you to get this. Why are we alive today? Why doesn't Jesus just beam you out of here? He says, because I've got great purpose for you that you haven't even begun to understand. So let's get practical. How do we do that? I'm going to give two steps to us, church, of how we live out heaven on earth today. Number one, I'm going to say we need to change our expectations. We need to change what we expect from God, and we need to change what we expect from life. We don't belong to this kingdom anymore. So if we're living as though we do, if we're living as, as kids that have their toys getting messed with and they're throwing a tantrum, again, daddy of five, I know what that looks like. Can I just say this? And I say it in love, and I don't say it to this house, but I've seen it for too many Christians. There are too many Christians walking around like toddlers whose toys are being messed with. But let's say again. If you don't believe me, go on social media. There are too many Christians talking about the injustices. Why is this happening to me? Why is this against me? Why is this going on? And I tell you, you're going to miss why you're going through your trials. You're going to miss that your trials are for you. God's doing something in you, because what God's doing in the refiner's fire is taking everything that no longer belongs to you in this kingdom and burning it away from you. Because you're now a resident of the kingdom of heaven, you're not supposed to look like the earth anymore. How do we change our expectation? Well, everywhere Jesus went, Jesus did three things. He preached the kingdom of God, he healed the sick, and he set the captive free. Basically, every place the enemies come to touch us, Jesus came to destroy what the enemy was doing. So people are under hopelessness. Jesus said, I'm going to preach the kingdom of God and tell them what's going People are under sickness. He says, that's foreign. You were never meant to carry sickness as a human being. He said, I'm going to demolish it. I'm going to heal them. They're carrying around oppression and depression, and they're being worn down and worn out. And he says, no, I'm going to set them free from their enemy. And listen, he showed up with the 12. Everywhere the 12 went, they did that. 72 unnamed followers of Christ, they did that. He shows up after the resurrection and says, now go and preach the kingdom to all the world. Go do the same thing. 
Go carry my presence everywhere you go. So this is what I'd say humbly to us. We're called, we're called to walk by faith and not by sight. We need to actually expect that, church. We need to expect the power of God to fall. We need to, need to expect his kingdom to be greater than the kingdom we reign in. We need to hold him to his promises. When he says we are something, we need to live like it. We're told to not give up on meeting together. Why? Because when we get isolated, we lose heart. That's what the book of Hebrews says. It says that's why we've got to stay together. We've got to have times like this where we charge each other to remember who we are so that we go after it. We've got to change our expectation. How do we change our expectation? Remember when the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? We didn't miss Christians. Praying is one of the most foundational things we can do. Amen? Amen. Praying is important. Amen. Say praying is important. Praying is important. Praying is important. <clears throat> By the way, I hope you're not taking this as a heavy word because, oh, it's a good word. Because you know what? If you're feeling like, man, I'm just not living this, you can't. You just got to receive it. It's awesome. Amen. This isn't yours to fail. Okay? You can't live it. You just got to receive it. So he said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And you remember he taught them how to pray. And we've, we've turned it into a very popular prayer. So if you know it, I want you to say it with me. Pray right? like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Stop. Very beginning of the prayer, this is what he says. Your daddy, and your ways are so much higher than my ways. You're hallowed, you're holy, you're lifted up. But I know that you're inviting me to share your ways because you've called me to be a king and a queen with you. You've called me to reign in the kingdom of earth. By the way, that's your, that's your job. You're to reign and bring the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of earth. How do I know it? It's the very first thing he tells them to pray. Your kingdom come. By the way, it's not a request. You read it in the Greek, it's a command. So it's this, Dad, you're awesome. I love you. You're amazing, Dad. Kingdom come! You don't see that in a lot of American churches. But that's it. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. You say, wait a second. Is God calling for believers to expect the kingdom of heaven to manifest on earth? Well, let's look at the next part of the prayers. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Where is where? Okay. On earth. Kingdom of earth as it is in the kingdom of heaven. Now check this out. If that's just a really nice flowery thing we pray and we don't have authority, it doesn't really do anything. But if you're a king and a queen and you've been sent as an ambassador, so the Bible says, it says you're an ambassador in a foreign kingdom. It says that God sent you. You know what an ambassador is, right? An ambassador is somebody sent by the authority of the king from one kingdom to another to carry out the king's wishes to the left. Okay? That's you. That's me. We live in this kingdom. We belong to that kingdom. And he says, what do I want you to do in this kingdom so that you don't lose heart? I want you to show up and remember that I'm the true king. You stand in this kingdom and say, hey, Lucifer, tyrant, you're not the king. You know who the king is? My father in heaven. And he's hallowed. He's lifted so far above your little kingdom. And you know what I'm going to say in this kingdom today? I'm calling that kingdom to come and manifest in this one. Amen. And I'm expecting his will to be done. We've got to change our expectation. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say this, guys. We've got to manifest our Father. Mm -hmm. You want to know how to really, practically, you want to know how to release heaven on earth. I said it at the beginning. Hope is the key. If the church were seen for hope more than anything else, we'd see revival, wouldn't we? If the church stood as a beacon of hope that showed itself in joy and in power, we'd see revival. So what do we need to do? We need to take an example from our king and love people the way he did. Remember when Jesus bad and people caught in sin? Did he ever blast them? No. Did he ever distance himself from them? Did he build a monastery and say, they're too dirty, I'm going to stay away from them? No. What Jesus did, actually, think about the woman caught in adultery. Caught in adultery. In the act. I'll let you fill in the details. The man wasn't brought out, but the woman was brought out. And they said, kill her. She sinned. She deserves to die. You remember what Jesus did? He wrote in the sand. He wrote in the sand. You know why he wrote in the sand? He was writing to her. He said, I'm not even going to address this religion. And it carries on a little bit further. And as it carries on, they say, well, aren't you going to kill her? That's what the law, that's what that kingdom, the kingdom of this earth, that's what it says. She needs to die. And he goes, great. Whoever's without sin, cast the first stone. <coughs> Whoever's holy enough to do it. Because if you're going to stone her, you're going to need to follow by stoning yourself. And they all leave because there's only one present without sin. And then he looks to her, and I want you to notice what he said. He doesn't say, hey, lady, A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe in me. C, pray a prayer, and one day I'm getting you out of here. That is not the conversation. You know what he says? Precious daughter, where have all your accusers gone? Listen to me. You want to know how to be Jesus to broken people? You tell them that their accuser has lost his right to accuse anymore. Because there's a father that's adored them from eternity past, and he alone has the power to set them free from their own. He says, I absorb you. Then you know what he says? Listen, does he deal with sin? Yes, he does. 
says, go leave your life of sin. Does he deal with sin? Yeah. But check it out, right? Here it is. Precious daughter, I love and adore you. I love you. I see who you really are. Who you are is not what you've done. What you did was sin. I know you don't want to be there, so you don't really need to preach. By the way, church, do we really need to convince people they're messing up? Come on. Have you ever met a person out at Walmart and say, do you believe there's a thing called sin and brokenness? They're like, no, I'm perfect. <laughs> We're hammering home the wrong point. We're walking through <clears> the door trying to tell people who think they're failing. You're failing, but God loves you. It's not the gospel. He said, yeah, you know what you've done. I don't even need to retrace it. I'm not going to do what they said. I'm not going to cast stones at you and say, you did this, and you did this, and you did this, and you did this. He said, no, what I'm going to say is it's sin, but God will leave it. Yes. There's a purpose. Leave this kingdom yes. behind. Remember the woman at the well? Jesus was called in the middle of the day. She was going out to get water. It's hot. She's alone. She's isolated from everybody. Everybody judges her. Jesus shows up, and he says, you're such a sinner! What you do is awful. You disgust me. No wonder you're alone. You're sweating out here, aren't you? It's hot. No. Jesus went there. Do you remember what Jesus said? Hey, this is tough. You come in out every day to get water, isn't it? What if I could give you water that would last forever? See, it always starts from, with an offer from, offer from a God who adores you. And then now check it out. Is sin still in the story? Oh, yeah. Because she says, there's no way, because I've really screwed up. I've really messed this thing up. Because I've really messed this thing up, there's no way you can love me. He said, oh, just so we can make this as a footnote and move on, you've been married four times, you're living with a fifth guy that's not your husband, right? She goes, he goes, awesome, living water. I just want to get back to that. Is Jesus aware of our sins? Yes, he doesn't want to dwell on them. He already pays for them. So he says, I adore you. There's sin that's keeping you from it. And you know what he says? He says, listen, I want you to come. Do you remember what that lady did in that place? She went and started a citywide revival. She went and said, check out the guy who knows everything about me, and yet he adores me. Yeah. See, that's the power of God falling. How do we bring revival? How do we bring heaven to earth? Look like Jesus. Stop freaking out. Stop thinking it's yours. Stop freaking out when somebody says, I'm a homosexual. I'm a Muslim. They're people. Yes. Yeah. You know what all people need? Homosexual, Muslim, bisexual, Christian, Buddhist. You know what they all need? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. All of them. And they need Jesus to manifest in love. And he said that's the core of the gospel. We don't have to be the Savior. We just have to know him. Right. How do you bring heaven to earth? You recognize that you're an ambassador. And by the way, the only reason we're living in this moment now, it's for you, for you to be refined, and for them. I want to read one final passage to you, and then I'm going to pray. I want you to get this and let it go home. This is 1 Peter 1. It's talking about how we can live today. It says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. Listen, where you stand with Jesus can never be touched. You being a king or a queen can never be touched. You being loved by him, we sang it earlier, there's nothing that could ever separate us. He said it's secure, and he says, listen, this inheritance is being kept secure in heaven for you, who through faith are being shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now listen, now we're going to deal with today. He said there's a future hope, there's something that's not yet, but you live here. What do you do? In this, greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you've had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials, these have come so the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Here it is. I want you to get this. Get this. He said you're going through things that are broken. Can I get an amen? You're going through things that aren't what they should be. You got things going on in your, your finances, your health, what other people think of you, and it's broken. And sometimes you get frustrated when we talk about bringing heaven to earth and you want to pray the simple prayer. God, take it. You ever pray, God, take it. He doesn't take it. And you go, how the heck do I bring heaven to earth? He said, no, no, no. There's a thing called trials that are supposed to come. Now, not all trials are from the Lord. I'm certainly not saying that. We have an enemy. He's relentless. You need to know who you are. Mm -hmm. He said, however, there are trials, and there's a purpose for trials from God. They're going, they're going to refine you in a refiner's fire to burn away what doesn't belong to you. Because though you're a citizen of this kingdom, sometimes you look like a citizen of this kingdom. And that doesn't belong to you anymore, and it grieves you greatly, and it weighs you down. And so he wants to burn it off of you. Got it? 
Now, in his great mercy, check it out, he doesn't do it in a corner. He does it in front of all humanity. You know why? Mm. Because when they see with all of my issues, with all of my past, the transformation, mm. it results yes. in praise, glory, and honor oh, being given you. to Jesus Christ. Yes. Because they see what it looks like for an ordinary person to transfer from this kingdom to this yes. kingdom. Yes. Why are your trials being put on display to fulfill your mission within the kingdom of God? Yes. Stop complaining against your king and thinking he's forgotten you. All right. It says this. Though you don't see him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him. And you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy because you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So therefore, here it is for today. With your minds fully alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you in Jesus Christ to reveal at his coming. What's he saying? He's saying you want to know how to walk with inexpressible joy today. Don't set your hope here. Don't put your hope in your bank account, in your health, in your job, in your house, in your kids' behavior. Don't put your hope in the next status report at work or the next promotion. Don't put your hope in what people are saying about you on Facebook. He said, step away from that. Know who you are. You belong to this kingdom. You don't need to play by the rules of this kingdom anymore. You're present in this kingdom to take people from this kingdom to that one. And the way you do it is to show them that there's a God who adores them, who has more life and adventure and hope than they could possibly imagine. So with that, I want to ask you to close your eyes for just a minute. And we're going to pray. I want to give you just a few challenges this morning. The first question I want to ask you is this. Where are you living your life like you're a future resident of heaven that needs to just ride out the storm? And where do you need to start thinking like a king or a queen who's supposed to live adventure today? Where are you numbing your pain to distract life away because you feel like it's going unlived? It's really important because God's offer is always to whoever will. He's the God of all hope. He wants to give it all to you. Second question I would ask is where are you misunderstanding your trials? What's a trial you're going through right now that's just been stealing your peace? Stealing your hope, stealing your joy, maybe even making you wonder where God's gone in it. Now listen, I believe as sons and daughters, what we need to do in trials is we need to go before our Father and we need to ask Him because He's the God who speaks. We need to say, God, what's going on? Is this self-inflicted? Is this the enemy? Or is this a refining fire that you've said we need to discern the difference? Where are you misunderstanding your trials? The reality is this, God isn't trying to take something from you, he's trying to get heaven into you. And in his refining, he's doing it for you, not against you. The third question I'd ask, where do you need to get deliriously happy and just live today? Where do you need to stop thinking about the next advancement the next status report, the next thing you need to get free of, and just live with the God who adores you. God knew the woman who was caught in adultery was caught in adultery. He knew she couldn't save herself, and he adored her. And he said, listen, go and live today. What are the burdens you need to bring before your king? And your prayer may start very simple. It may be you just saying, God, I need to see how much you adore me. I don't even understand. Please show me how much you adore me. Maybe you're in here to say, God, you're real. I need to see you the way he seems to see you. Maybe you're at the place not understanding what it means to be a king or a queen, to reign, and that you just begin to speak to him and say, God, show me how to not just ride out the storm. Show me how to fulfill the purpose you've given me. God, show me what it is to belong to the kingdom of heaven on mission in the kingdom of earth. Did you just ask him a simple question this morning? Say, God, what would you say to me? Let's take 30 seconds and just listen. God, what would you say to me?
close today. I just want to pray a blessing over you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take what you've begun speaking to our hearts and that it would give us hope. We're adored by you. You love us. I pray that you fill us with hope. And so now I pray, may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and all peace as you trust in him so that you would overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Show us how to manifest you in every way. And now lift every burden that we can enjoy the journey. We ask you to do it. Well, God bless you, kings and queens, sons and daughters, amazing, beautiful people. Two weeks from now is Easter, so I want to ask you today, if you haven't gotten a chance to get the emotional yes or something right outside, please turn in one of those cards and tell us to join a group. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday. God bless you.